All right, well, now time for something a little light and breezy um, as I take a break from Battalion Combat Series for just a moment. Um, I am going to be playing Fields of Battle, Volume 1, The Great Northern War, um, by the Historical Game Company. This is my first game by the Historical Game Company. And uh, as far as I know, there is no Fields of Battle Volume 2 yet. Um, this is a game published in 2015, and it is a tactical uh, game about the Great Northern War, which is a topic that I'm really interested in and I find really fascinating. As you know, on this channel, I, re I did a playthrough of the Narva and Poltava battles, both of which are contained in this box, um, from Against the Odds, and I did not really like that game. So I've been on the hunt for another Great Northern War game um, that I have yet to play and don't own. I do have um, Pax Baltica, which is about the Great Northern War, a block game, but it's really strategic and not... Um, it's a different scale than this. This is a tactical battle game, and as you can see here, we've got the Battle of Narva in 1700 set up. Russians, Swedes. We've got the train effects chart over here, and on the back of this is a sequence of play. This is a very simple game system. Six pages of rules, um, or less potentially, depending on how you want to qualify the glossary. Um, but it does contain eight battles from the Great Northern War, all played on a, a small um, um, 17 by 11... Uh, map, um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty straightforward, so um, most of the battles are governed by morale, so you're trying to reduce the opponent uh, opponent's morale to zero, when you do that you win, um, typically there's a time limit on the game, this game will go up to 15 turns, if the Swedes have not defeated the Russians by turn 15, the Russians will have won, and if you know anything about the Battle of Narva, we've got sort of your classic double siege going on here, almost a, a Elysia situation, so basically, we've got some Russians here um, besieging the Swedish defenders in the city of Narva in modern-day Estonia. Here's the Narva River. Then we've got a series of uh, field works built in a ring around that siege by Russia because Charles and his Swedish army have shown up in the middle of a blizzard and plan to try and take the walls by force. Now, if you watch my game... Um, uh, from the Against the Odds title, you know that the, the snow was blowing into the Russian faces and they couldn't see anything, and the Swedes basically went right up to the walls and stormed the walls. There's this bridge here, starting on turn 9, which is what I've marked here. The Russians can evacuate units across that bridge, um, and then for every two units they get across the bridge, um, they will, I believe, reduce Swedish morale by one. So the Swedes, they want to get in here quickly, and they want to uh, eliminate as many Russians as possible. Now, the Russians don't have great units. Uh, in fact, a lot of them, like these militia units here, are absolutely terrible. Um, and most of the wall is lined with these militia units. So definitely the Swedes want to, like, breach the wall, the field works where they can, where some of these weaker units are. Now, Russia does have artillery support. You can see some artillery units here. We've got some irregular infantry, and they've also got a cavalry reserve behind this hill over here. They're probably going to want to put to good use. Um, Sweden, much better troops, but far fewer of them. Uh, looking at the values on a counter, we're looking at that first number is the number of dice they get to roll when they attack. Fives and sixes in this system are going to cause, uh, are going to be successful hits. Fives being a disruption, and if you flip a unit over, you can see that it has a disrupted side. And uh, a six being an eliminated result. Um, so there are modifiers. The terrain effects will list what uh, what the terrain does in movement and combat. It's all pretty pretty simple. Um, these are actually really good counters. They are the they are the uh, Blue Panther printed sort of laser cut, really thick counters. But I really like the sort of very simple playable aesthetic style. But the color um, the colors that they've used for uh, for the silhouettes and for the text is really nice. Um, and so it really kind of evokes the uniforms uh, of each side in this particular situation. Um, I'm excited to play through this. These shouldn't take me too long. We might do one or two per video. We'll see how this one goes. Um, and I'm going to spare you sort of the tactical movements and stuff. I'll just show you when there's important stuff happening and recap what's going on. But I should be able to play this probably in, you know, an hour or two. And, uh, and yeah, and tell a nice story. And hopefully better than the Against the Odds game. We'll see. Um, uh, incidentally, the Historical Games Company has a series of games... Uh, battle games now that they're coming out with um, all single battles, nothing quite like this, but I wanted to start with this package because uh, it, you know, Great Northern War and also eight battles, but uh, they have a siege or a um, Battle of Quebec game that uh, looks pretty interesting from a French and Indian War perspective that uses a similar system. Speaking of the system, I should also mention here, each side is going to have these tactical cards. Uh, each side has their own deck, the Russians and the Swedes, and 
every turn, you're gonna have a hand limit. So it's kind of like commands and colors. Uh, in this scenario, each side's gonna get three, and these do different things. So you can see here, cavalry charge, it tells you when you can play, right? Uh, which phase you can play it in, and you can do the effect on the card. And you're gonna have three per turn, and at the end of the turn, you'll be able to discard as many as you want from your hand, and then draw back up to three. Here's the sequence of play, it's pretty easy. You can move your leaders, reassign them, You get your artillery get to fire. Um, and then you get to do your movement phase, your combat phase, your rally phase, and then discard and draw tactical cards, player two goes, check for victory, go to the next turn. So it should fly by really quickly. Initiative is a high die roll, but you're modifying that by the number of leaders in the game. Uh, Russia has two leaders, they've got one here and they've got one here. Uh, so they'll be adding plus two to their initiative roll, and Sweden's got four, one, two, three, four. So likely Sweden will have the initiative most of the game. And, uh, and yeah, historically they did win this battle, so uh, we'll find out how that goes. But uh, all in all, pretty simple, and uh, looking forward to a nice breezy tactical experience here on a small map, um, even though it does have a lot of counters in it. So let's get started, the Battle of Narva, 1700, here we are. All right, so we're off to a good start for the Swedes. Um, so the first thing that happened is with their uh, uh, initiative, they decided to do their artillery combat phase. They did some shelling here across these field works, no effect. The artillery in Narva, um, the only one that could fire was this, uh, was this unit here, this artillery unit, and it fired out. It actually did hit this Russian artillery unit that was here, forcing it to disrupt and fall back. So that's going to take the city out of shelling range uh, from the Russian artillery, which is great. Now we're going to do our regular movement phase, and our movement phase in this game... You can move any units that are with or adjacent to a leader. So all four of, or five of these stacks can move if they would like. Same here, and then same here. In addition to that, you are allowed two unit movements anywhere. They don't have to be in the range or um, influence of a leader. So we're going to figure out where the Swedes want to attack the uh, entrenchments here to try and carve their way in, in through this line to get to the rear of these besiegers. And I'm thinking that the place that I probably want to do it is maybe here or here because this artillery is dangerous and this uh, Russian militia unit is is really weak. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. We might we're gonna try and maybe bust in here, uh, and then on this side, you know, Charles is really good. He provides a plus one in combat, but I don't want to get him killed um, or removed um, by a counterattack. So. Um, we're going to move up. We're going to figure it out. Um, the one thing I should mention here is that uh, the Swedes are under, in every scenario in this game, unless stated otherwise, are um, required to do melee combat. So they cannot attack at range. Like I said, the middle number is your range. There are uh, units that can do ranged fire in this game um, or close combat. The Swedes are under military doctrine that they can only do close combat. So they have to get right up to these entrenchments. Additionally, the Russians, with the snow blowing into their face in this direction, they're not allowed to do ranged combat either, except for uh, the artillery... Uh, units shelling the city, I believe. So let's get cracking with the Swedish move and see if we can bust in there. All right, well, after the first turn, uh, we've had a, some skirmishing along the front, uh, some inconclusive results, except for this Swedish heavy cavalry who managed to breach the field works here against this, um, this militia, this Russian militia holding this position. So now this heavy cav is in a position next turn to attack any one of these three units, hopefully make a hole and let the rest of the uh, Swedes uh, in for the battle. The Russians clearly not in a good spot. I mean, they, they only have two leaders, so they can't move a lot of these defenders. They're just trying to slow the Swedes down. Um, these Russian militia have zero dice, so they're not even allowed to roll, and the, the artillery are not allowed to fire into the snowstorm. The only artillery that could have fired was this disrupted unit here, and obviously there's no leader there. Next turn, I'm thinking I might want to move um, this leader, Shermatevo, uh, over here. Let's see, can you get there? One, two, three, four. Yeah, he'll be able to get there and try and rally this guy. Um, and we also need to try and rally here. We need a leader for that. But I don't want Ducori or Ducroy to uh, be in a dangerous position because he's worth uh, he's worth morale to the Swedes if they can eliminate him. So we're trying the frontal assault. We'll see how it goes, and uh, might reposition if it doesn't seem to be going anywhere uh, quickly. All right. So turn two, combat phase. Swedes played the sword does not jest gives plus two to any attack uh, uh, where Charles the twelfth is uh, stacked with the infantry or cavalry unit he attacked this Russian artillery piece here um, got plus two from the card plus another one from his counter plus three we rolled a five as you can see so we've eliminated this Russian artillery unit from the game and uh, Charles can take ground with his infantry his uh, Swedish elite infantry unit who goes right there. 
Swedes with a big turn. They played Kreitz's Charge. That gave all their Dragoons and Heavy Cavalry plus one on the attack. And we eliminated a fair number of Russians. Russian morale now is down to 12. And the line is starting to collapse as the Swedes basically fight their way in all along the front of the entrenchments. Um, Russians are going to have to really think about how they want to counterattack this. They do still have some uh, Dragoons over here that they can use. They're going to want to try and undisrupt a lot of these units, but they have Cavalry Charge. Um, and they also have Russian Dragoons as well. So there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of options. They can also make their irregular units uh, fight at plus one. So there's a lot of options for them, uh, but they're going to have to do this quickly to push back the Swedes because it's been an onslaught this turn. Well, Decroix had just finished rallying this militia, or these irregulars, I should say, to try and get them back in the fight. And uh, Charles swept in behind him with this elite infantry he got a plus five on the dice but he didn't even really need it he got a six that's going to just straight out eliminate this russian unit which is going to be one morale but he also eliminates ducroy because when a leader's uh, uh when a unit is eliminated uh, a leader is eliminated unless they're within two of another unit so actually he might not eliminate ducroy i think ducroy is probably going to retreat over to one of these units but uh nevertheless a punishing attack from the king himself Okay, so the rule is actually that if there's a unit adjacent to the leader, uh, they can go to that unit. So uh, Decroy lives to fight another day here, but I suspect with Charles in his rear, he's not going to be having a lot of fun on the upcoming Russian turn. Well, it's just a mess here at the Battle of Narva. Uh, the Swedes have just like swept the Russians off the fortifications, the, the field works, and they're just racking up. Look at the casualties. They are slaughtering the Russians. The Russian morale down to eight. Um, the, the Russian left is actually holding this turn. Um, this unit here, this, um, it looks like a militia infantry had a free rear attack on the Swedish heavy cavalry, but unfortunately with the plus two couldn't do a hit or demoralization. That would have actually been very punishing because there's zones of control in these hexes. So they wouldn't have been able to retreat. So that's a huge missed opportunity there. Um, elsewhere, <laughs> it's been pretty ugly for the Russians. This, uh, Swedish heavy cav unit is closing in on the Russian camp. Uh, we do have a Russian elite infantry unit um, defending. That artillery is probably going to go down next turn. And Decroy actually managed to counterattack successfully on this Swedish infantry across the, the field works and has advanced outside the ring. Um, and the only thing over here is artillery. Um, so this will be interesting to see if he can make anything of that. It's kind of like a break free charge trying to get out there. Fortunately, this turn, the Swedes played messenger delayed, which prevented any... Russian unit, uh, Russian leader from activating their adjacent units for movement. So everyone here is frozen in place in the chaos of this battle and the chaos of the winter storm, fear, uh, logistics breaking down. We did have one good thing happen for the Russians, and that is this Russian elite unit here decided that he was going to peel off from the camp and try and make an assault on the walls of Narva. He needed to roll a six, I believe here. He's an elite unit attacking a non-elite unit, so that's plus one, but then minus two for the wall. So he needed to roll a six, and lo and behold, he actually rolled a six, which is going to disrupt this unit and send it back in there. Um, and uh, yeah, and he's going to take the ground into the city. So like this crack team of Russian soldiers have come in here, and that's really bad news for the Swedes because there could be a potential morale, a, a big morale penalty for losing the city. Uh, so we'll see what develops there. Um, we are going into uh, turn five here in a second, and even though we can go up to 15, I suspect this one's going to be over real shortly. Well, here we are turn six, and the game is not yet over, although it's getting there. The Russians at two morale, but the Swedes... All right, nine, a victim of a fierce counterattack from the Russians. Uh, the Russians got some real good die rolls on this turn, and they somehow actually won the initiative for turn six. So they got back-to-back -back turns, and that has actually allowed them to clear out some of the Swedish right flank and uh, ding the Swedish morale. Now, is it too little too late? Probably. But uh, they did eliminate one of uh, Carl, uh, Charles's leaders, and they did eliminate a couple of heavy cavalry here, which is uh, pretty big. Um, so the Swedish infantry are going to have to finish off the Russians, and we're about to do that right now. Um, so first thing in a turn, you are allowed to move your leaders up to four movement points. I'm going to move him because I want to try and get this final elimination. This unit will be able to move right up against that cavalry. Um, so let's move him, uh, but he wants to undisrupt him, doesn't he? All right, we're going to leave him there then. 
Um, does Charles want to move? No, I think we're good there. Does he want to move? Yes, he wants to go here so that he can command all of these units. Um, and I think that's going to be it. And then we get to do our artillery phase. Unfortunately, the only artillery within range was disrupted last turn by these Russian elites who are street fighting through Narva to try and uh, eject the Swedish there. So then we go to our movement phase. These three units can move, Charles can move, and then any two units of my choice. Um, here, we're just going to try and finish this off easily. We're going to go one. You're always allowed to pivot one hex side, and two will go in there. He can attack either this guy, who I think is disrupted. No. Um, oh, actually, he should have undisrupted last turn because he's got a leader on him. So we can attack him. He's a militia unit, or we can attack this militia unit from the rear, which is probably better. Um, these guys can't move because they're in enemy zones of control. That's okay. Um, Charles. If we can eliminate the camp, we can win the game. Let's try that. Let's have Charles... He's going to go one, two, like that, and he'll be able to attack the Russian camp. And then we've got two units uh, of any kind that we want to move. We're going to move this guy, one. These are, these are half on the road, and we'll move up right there. And then this cavalry unit will spend one, two. We'll go there. We'll try and gang up on this guy. All right, let's roll these combats, and we'll see how swiftly the Russian defeat comes. Well, that was quick. Charles ended up taking the Russian camp. And uh, that will do it for the uh, Battle of Narva. It's an overwhelming Swedish victory. And not certainly I think this is probably, um, this is the second one-sided Battle of Narva scenario. And it's very possible that the Battle of Narva is just not a very good game uh, battle because of how overwhelming it was for, it is for the Swedes and how it was historically. Um, so I'm going to chalk this one up to kind of a training scenario. I'm not sure I would ever play this one two players with the, as someone playing the Russians. Um, but it was nice to familiarize myself with the system. And uh, we have a Swedish victory here on turn six. No Russians escaping this one. Um, so I am going to uh, break this down, and I'm going to set up the next battle, and we'll do that here. And that is going to be the Battle of Klishov from 1702. 1702. Klishov, 1702. We'll see what that looks like. Maybe it'll be a little bit more competitive. But overall, in general, this is a really nice, small, simple tactical system uh, that's pretty fun to play and pretty quick to play solo as well. All right, Great Northern War, Battle of Klishov. Klesau? Klesau? I'm trying to pronounce it the Polish way. Klishov, which I believe is how you say that. Anyways, this is 1702. This is the second major battle, uh, well, I guess the third major battle uh, of the Great Northern War. And uh, it features the Swedes under Charles, mainly the same commanders and units uh, from the last scenario, um, versus an army of Saxons under the command of Augustus II, the king of the Saxons here and his army up against the bank of the Nida River um, in Poland. Uh, Charles has just conquered Warsaw and is now on the march to try and um, disintegrate the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth by striking a blow against Augustus. And they met on this field of battle and sort of in between these villages here. And uh, we've, you know, we've got Rabau and Klishov itself is down here. Um, and Gorky is there. We've also got on this wing, we've got uh, some Polish uh, units as well, mostly cavalry, mostly terrible cavalry. Although there's a couple heavy cavalry units in here as well. Historically, what happened is the Swedes launched an attack. They were outnumbered two to one. They launched an attack against the Saxons to try and defeat them. And as they and what they wanted to do was they wanted to avoid all these nasty rivers here, these streams, there's some swampy ground. They wanted to essentially come around this way and envelop the uh, Saxon right wing. And as they did that, some Polish units, cavalry, appeared on top of these hills, this high ground, and threatened to smash the Swedish uh, left flank. And so that caused uh, Charles and a bunch of the Swedish army to counterattack the Poles and try and drive them off. And it left the center open for the Saxons to come in here and try and um, essentially split the army into two and try and defeat them. Now, this was a Swedish victory historically because um, the Swedes ended up uh, like being able to adapt to the changing battlefield conditions quicker than the Saxons. Um, despite the Saxons having the positional advantage on the on this terrain. Um, and so this setup here kind of reflects the opening moments of the battle as the Swedes start to bring, you know, you can see they've got, um, you know, they've got some artillery here. They've got some pretty good cavalry here on the right um, under this leader. Charles is here. He's in the middle of reforming his infantry in this cavalry wing out here to attack the Poles. Um, for the Saxons, um, they have got uh, some pretty... Uh, nice long-range guns uh, posted behind this river line. They've got some elite infantry 
here. Um, they've got some cavalry dragoons out on here, which supported by some heavy cavalry. And then on this left flank here, they've got a good leader, Steinau. And uh, they've got, uh, looks like, uh, some more dragoons and some heavy cavalry. So uh, this is going to be a much more even battle than... Um, than we saw in Narva. And um, there are some special rules. Um, so first of all, the first thing we're going to see is the Swedish Ga Pa Doctrine, which means that they're not allowed to use ranged attacks. They must close to distance and do hand-to-hand -hand combat um, or close combat. Um, they're not al allowed to fire from range. Um, whereas the Saxons are not under that um, restriction, so they're going to be able to use that middle value on their counter. Um, that's their range, and they're going to be able to do ranged attack um, so they don't have to, we're not going to see that hand, hand to hand uh, fighting that we saw in Narva necessarily until the Swedes close. The other special rule here revolves around the poles. So each of these Polish units represents a morale. Uh, if they are destroyed or um, eliminated, they are do count as morale to the Saxon army. More importantly, if one of these heavy cavalry units is ever, um, I believe it is uh, demoralized, I believe the entire Polish core goes away. Let me double check that for you. Um... Yeah, so if either of the two Polish heavy cavalry units is, is becomes demoralized, all the Poles leave. They all become, uh, they basically go home. And that's what happened historically. They kind of withered under the Swedish charge and just left. Um, and so the Saxons are going to be, be careful about how they employ these units. Obviously, with no leader over here, um, they're not going to be able to move all of them all together, I think, unless they move a leader over here. But um historically the the saxons didn't command the poles they were kind of a fragmented alliance and so i uh, will be interested to see how the swedes approach this there's a hill here this seems to be the likeliest target um because he's in clear and uh and then we'll see if they can hold off the saxon uh, bombardments and uh saxon advances um yeah so this will be a little more fun and uh we're gonna get started here um we'll see if charles the 12th can overcome the numerical disadvantage to win as he did historically well, not a great opening start for uh, the coalition, the Saxons. Um, a Swedish cavalry charge uh, up in this direction. <clears throat> Literally, I just started resolving combat. This is the way the Swedes moved after the first, um, first movement phase. And under this leader here, this heavy cavalry unit and this uh, dragoons unit made a charge against the Polish uh, cav. Very first attack from here disrupted this Polish cavalry unit. What does that mean? That means every Polish unit from the disruption flees. So that is six units who all get removed from the map and who become uh, demoralization um, casualties for the Saxon player. And with that, uh, we don't need to worry about the Poles anymore. Um, they didn't get a chance to do anything, and this Swedish cavalry charge was super effective. Um, so we'll go and continue down the line, and uh, you can see I'm leaving a big gap here with this artillery piece, the Saxon artillery piece. We're going to try and pinch it off and cause some uh, chaos amongst the Saxon front. But now, a much more even battle, now that the Poles have just kind of like picked up and went home. All right, the battle has been joined after the end of turn one. Uh, Saxons had some pretty good effect across the line. Uh, fire from these infantry units on this hill managed to disrupt this Swedish cavalry unit. That allowed this Saxon cavalry uh, dragoon unit to recover. Since there's no zone of control with a disrupted unit, he's able to flip over. Also disrupted this uh, Swedish cavalry over here, this heavy cavalry across this stream. You can see he's got really bad odds. We had three attacks against him. Unfortunately, only one hit, but that stream is making it very difficult to get any sort of uh, leverage. He's going to need to recover next turn. I'm thinking I might move this leader over. Um, and the Swedes turning flank thing, we're going to see the effect of that coming up on turn two. The Swedes just won the initiative, um, and they're going to be able to bring up some of these units along this road and uh, make some progress here to turn this flank. You can see the um, the Saxons under uh, Schulenberg um, are already moving to contest that. We might see what we might do here. Um, since this unit will be able to move freely to extend the line. So, uh, yeah, uh, as the Swedes start closing, and they're going to walk right into the face of fire from the Saxons, and uh, you can see the effect of that here. Beginning of turn four, and uh, the Swedes are actually suffering pretty horribly. Uh, they've taken a boatload of casualties. The Saxons are putting up a pretty good fight. They've actually beat back the uh, Swedish left flank in this cavalry uh, flanking maneuver that the Swedes are trying to pull off, and now it's basically a core line of Swedish infantry who are going to attempt to do something here uh, against the Saxons. They do have this Saxon unit on the wrong side of the creek disrupted, so there may be a chance to eliminate that and move forward. But uh, all of this Saxon cavalry over here is going to be a huge problem for many of these units. The Swedes might think about putting this artillery unit on this hill to potentially provide some cover, but it's going to take a couple turns to do that. Meanwhile, the Saxons are going to get a lot of attacks, especially at range. 
So we'll see what happens. But uh, the battle unfolding in a way that I was not expecting, um, with the Saxons doing a good job of uh, defeating the Swedish. Well, just as I uh, have speak of the devil, um, we played the sword does not jest that gives Charles's attacks a plus two in addition to the plus one he's already had. He actually just eliminated Schulenberg. That is going to be a pretty big deal to the Saxon morale. And we've actually done a quite a, a decent number of casualties to the Saxons uh, this turn. So that's going to be minus one. Now we're even. And I have to check if losing Schulenberg... Um, well, he's, he's not lost, actually. He goes to the nearest unit. We're going to put him probably here let's put him there um does charles want to take take the ground um he's in a pretty good spot he doesn't want to get flanked i don't think he will i think he's going to stay right where he is and try and fight off the saxon right flank um and so that's where we are at the end of the swedish combat phase things a little more even with some losses to the saxons morale is even the battle 50 50 could turn on a dime well, the Saxons just brought in their horse grenadiers, um, a massive close combat and fire across the line. They eliminated uh, two Swedish units, and Charles was stacked with uh, the last one here in this village. Oh, actually, you know what? That might not have been an elimination. The village terrain, smaller village, uh, yeah, so it's a it's defender eliminated, which they rolled, actually becomes a defender... Um, uh, demoralized. So Charles is still in the fight, but it's going to be a very close thing here. Very lucky that he was taking cover in that village and see that terrain. Uh, so yeah, so uh, basically these horse grenadiers firing from the top of this hill uh, managed to strike a blow against the defenders there under the king. Uh, and now this entire Swedish left is entirely exposed. So uh, the initiative on the next turn is going to be very important. Swedish morale down to six. If they had lost Charles, they would have been at one. Uh, so not a great turn for the Swedes, but a great one for the Saxons. All right, that's a wrap. It's a Saxon victory. We have uh, displaced the historical uh, outcome of this battle, um, mostly because the Swedes just could not roll dice um, effectively. Uh, they just absolutely got hosed on the dice rolls many, many times in a row over the course of a couple turns. They had the opportunity to potentially push back, and they just like could not roll a single five or six on multiple dice. Um, and it just was really frustrating. Um, oh, Saxon cavalry and it got back here and managed to disrupt the, uh, Swedish camp that pushed their morale down below zero. And, uh, that is the end of the battle of Klesov, 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 um, here in 1702 with a Saxon victory over Charles the 12th. Not sure what the uh, political outcomes would be, uh, had this happened, but there you are. I think kind of a tough one for the Swedes to win, especially if they like if they just get really unlucky in this cavalry maneuver here. Um, it started well for them, but that is the second battle in uh, Fields of Battle Volume 1, The Great Northern War, and uh, it's a fun tactical system. I mean, it's not super complex, super deep. There's not a lot of mechanical complexity to it. Definitely on the lighter end of tactical uh, games. Um, probably the closest thing it reminds me of is Jour de Gloire from Via Victus the Napoleonic tactical series. Um, a lot of similarities there. I think this is better than Jour de Gloire. Um, there's a little bit more fidelity. There's a little bit more room for non-deterministic outcomes, and so it's a little bit more emergent. Um, and obviously, you can't beat the value with um, eight battles in this box. So that'll wrap it up for this video. hope you enjoyed this. I may do some more of these. Next one is Fraustat from 1706. Um, just because they're super fun to play, super quick, I may do another pair of these battles. Um, let me know what you think. Um, if you want to see more um, Fields of Battle, Great Northern War, and uh, I will bust out the other maps. Thanks for watching.